Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to my session uh, account on exit and succession planning. Quite a lot to do in 45 minutes, so we're just going to have a bit of a canter. Uh, many of my examples, as some of you may have heard me before, uh, today anyway, are going to be based on astronauts. So a bit of a starter quiz. Do we know that chap is? No? Ed White, no? first American in space to walk in space. Unfortunately, he died, didn't he, on the test pad launch on Apollo 1. This up here? You're useless, actually. That's Jim Lovell, commander of Apollo 13, that, that horrible mission which nearly went wrong. And you must know the last one. Well done, one out of three. A bit better than last year. Right, so, succession planning. Uh, what I've got here is about an overview of what a typical owner-manager will be thinking about when he considers succession planning. There's a very important rule that you need to be aware of, and that is the 30-13-3 rule. Do you know what that is? It's based on a study that tells us that 30% of family companies make it to the second generation, 30% to the third, and 3% to the fourth. Yeah? So that just gives you an idea about how family companies might devolve uh, along the family line. So in terms of the choice for owner managers, and I'm sure you will have come across this as well, um, many owner managers of course like to hand over the business to their children. And the issues that surround that of course is, do the children want to carry on the business? And also in many cases, the owner manager will be reluctant to pass the business down to their children probably because he doesn't really trust them at the moment. So, um, and aligned with that, because um, there will be times when there will be the, the uh, succession path of the next generation, but as we know, we can use the purchase of own shares there to great effect to deliver capital gains tax receipts for the owner manager when he basically retires. If you haven't got a succession plan in terms of handing down to the next generation, then where many owner managers do, Either they go through a trade sale, yes, where they seek to sell their business to, the net, to a third party, or, and I, and I, in fact, I was only meeting one yesterday, he doesn't really want to do a trade sale because he really doesn't want to go through the stress of going to find a buyer for his business. And therefore, where many people end up is some form of management buyout, where they get together with their senior management team and do a deal to hand over the business to the senior management team. And you won't get the same price where you sell to managers because they can't afford to pay top dollar. Whereas, of course, on a trade sale, you end up having the best of all, all worlds because you'll get the best price, arguably. That's the cover on that side. So what I'm going to do in this short time is take you through three basic points. One is tax efficient share sales. Then we're going to look at how we pass the business down to the next generation and when to do that. And lastly, looking at the purchase of own shares in an owner manager company uh, using the multiple completion technique. And I'll explain what that is when we come to it. So tax efficient share sales, and you can see here, there are three sorts of um, constituents of possible share sale consideration. Cash is obviously the most common form where on day one, we'll receive the sale proceeds in cash. That could either be immediate or deferred, yes, or and or deferred. In some company sales, we end up with a situation where we're going to pay a million today and a million pound in a year's time. For capital gains tax, that sort of transaction, all that two million pounds will be taxed on day one under the rule in section 48 TCGA. If you don't receive that extra million pounds, then section 48 does allow you to go back and repair the return or amend the return and therefore you'll amend your return only to one million. Another very common feature of company share sale transactions is where the, the buyer is going to offer shares and or loan notes. Okay, And as we know, as far as tax is concerned, if we generally take loan notes, we will get a deferral of our capital gains tax. But if you want to claim entrepreneur's relief, Sometimes, in fact, in many cases, the vast majority of cases, you will need to make an election, yes, under section 169R or Q, depending on whether you've got a QCB or non-QCB, to tax the loan note 
at the date of sale itself. Yes, because you will not get entrepreneurs leave on your loan note consideration if you don't make that election. Now, of course, the buyer may also offer you shares in the company, and that will be a share for share exchange. Uh, if you're doing that, a couple of things to remember, if you're doing a share for share exchange and you've still got entrepreneurs leave capacity, you may not, of course, qualify in relation to the new shares you've got in the acquiring company. Uh, but you can, again, make a further election to treat the share sale consideration as though it was cash and cash in on your ER and get an uplifted base cost. But most people with shares don't really want to take that risk because, of course, if the price or the value of the shares goes down, you have locked yourself into uh, an unrealised gain for tax, which you got, don't get any relief for. Lastly, the one uh, area that often causes problems, but again is a very common feature, and that is the earnout. Uh, earnout basically uh, is a type of consideration where the consideration is based on the post-acquisition profits of the company, generally a formula based. Yeah? So it could be actually once, two, three, four times post-tax profits. Problem, the problem with earnout, of course, is defining what we mean by post-acquisition profits, uh, and the agreement will actually therefore have to be very careful about how it defines the profits for earnout purposes. The seller obviously will need some protection because if the buyer is in control of the company on day one, it is not beyond the wit of some nasty buyers to manipulate the profits of that company. So the seller will need protection in the SPA. Um, one of the common strange features of earnouts, as opposed to normal deferred consideration, is that under the Man v. Ingalls principle, you get taxed on the value of the right to receive the earnout. Okay? And that forms part of your initial share sale consideration. And therefore, if you qualify for ER, that will qualify for ER. But then when you come to receive your earnout consideration, yes, you will only get you won't get entrepreneurs relief on the difference between the actual receipt and the value you bought in on day one. Yeah, broadly that's the way. Because the earnout is itself a right and not shares in the company. Okay, so I'm sure you all have got one of these. This is your new ER clock. Just to emphasize from 6th of April, I in a couple of days' time, the qualifying period for ER moves from one year to two. Yes, everybody happy with that? I do like to see a few more nodding heads. It's two years now, so get into that mindset for entrepreneurs' leave. Right, so there you are. Yes? PowerPoint technology here. Right, so very quick canter through entrepreneurs' leave conditions. I'm sure most of you know these, but let's just go through them. The qualifying period now is two years, and throughout that qualifying period, the individual shareholder must have 5% of the ordinary share capital, the voting rights, and also you'll see in yellow on that slide another condition that was introduced in the last Finance Act, and that is now you have to have 5% of the economic rights as well. And what that broadly means, which is the easiest rule, is two tests but most people will qualify on the basis that if under the terms of the articles or the share sale contract they get at least 5% yes, of the sale proceeds, then they will qualify for ER. Yeah, but it's three tests now, not two. Order share capital, 5%. Voting rights, 5%. And share of sale proceeds, at least 5%. You do also have to be a director or employee of a company. Do remember that this line goes all the way here over a two-year period. So do be aware if on a sale, and maybe this often happens when you're getting rid of um, a director, it may be, and you actually sack him before you do the actual sale of his shares back to the company, he won't qualify for ER. He's got to be a director right until he sells the shares. And lastly, of course, we've got to be a trading company. I'm not going to spend valuable time on doing that, but we do know it's a very stringent test, isn't it, for entrepreneurs leave? Uh, what we normally call the 80-20 test. So at least 80% of the company must be trading. Yes. How do we go about determining whether or not the company is trading? We have a number of tests, and what I'm going to do, just to save time, is we're going to pick those up when we look at business property relief for IHT. But do remember, we're looking there at an 80-20 test for entrepreneurs leave. The BPR, actually, it's more than, a, more than half. 
uh, 51.49. Okay, so I'll just take you through a, a very simple deal structure here. So this is Jim. Okay, you've already seen Jim, haven't we? Apollo 13. Does anyone know what Aquarius was? Never mind. That was Odyssey, which was the, the ship that actually blew up in mean orbit. And Aquarius is the poor little lifeboat there, which was meant to land on the moon, but that's the thing that got them home. Yeah? You're learning more about space today as well as tax, yes? Right, so moving on to the bar, which is Aquarius PLC, we're going to acquire Jim's company, Odyssey Limited. He's a 100% shareholder, and I've put down there the various elements of the deal. Cash consideration, loan notes, which I'm going to assume will be a qualifying corporate bond, and then we have an earnout there. And what I've said there is the earnout, the maximum amount you can receive is 1.8. Yeah? But of course, it could be anything between zero and 1.8, depending upon the profit met after acquisition. So in terms of the tax profile, what you would normally expect to see, as far as tax is concerned, as far as the share sale consideration, I'm sure you'll agree the 4.5 will drop into this year, yep, 1920. The loan notes, of course, um, if we do nothing, the loan notes will actually be taxed when redeemed in 21-22, because it's a two-year loan note, yes? But he won't qualify for entrepreneurs leap on that because at that point it won't uh, the top company, Aquarius, will not be his personal company. Yeah? So if he does nothing, then there'll be 20% tax to pay on the two million. As far as the earnout rise is concerned, what we end up having here is being taxed on the value of the earnout right. Yeah? So that is a valuation that you will put on your tax return and then you'll have to agree with shares valuation division if it's material, yeah, generally speaking. So I'm assuming here that we've got a valuation of one, but of course there is an incentive to make sure that's quite high, yeah, because any leakage on that value, when we actually receive the earnout right, let's say we receive 1.4, the capital gains tax will bring in the 1.4 but the one million will be deducted as base cost being the value of the right at the date of the share sale, yeah? But that is not a disposal of shares, that's a disposal of the right, and therefore you're gonna get taxed at 20% on the point four. Yeah, everybody with me on that? Okay, now we could improve that position by making a 169R election, and what that does is it brings in the two million which would normally be taxed on a deferral basis here and brings it in to the share sale consideration yeah when we tax the two million and you can see there by electing under 169r we end up saving 10 percent yeah on the two million very important therefore to make an election it's one of those very short time limits it's basically the first anniversary of the 31st of january following the end of the year of disposal yeah so are you happy with that so if you're going to make an election, do make, make sure that the compliance side is tight on that and you don't miss the boat. Otherwise, client will not be very happy. Yeah? I've come across situations where clients and advisors mix up, no election made, client gets very upset because he realises he's missed the opportunity to obtain entrepreneurs leave. Okay, so that's the... Um, I saw this actually at a restaurant in, in London which I thought was pretty good about tax on children. Yeah, 30% is quite reasonable, isn't it? Okay, so passing down to equity to the next generation. Uh, on this slide here, I've, I've summarised the main taxes that we need to consider when we're transferring shares to the next generation. It could be the children or a close family member. The first thing to point out though, if we transfer shares to a close family member or indeed a very close friend, there is a special let out in the tax legislation that says these are not employment related securities. So even though it's a gift to a family member, we can forget about any employment tax issues. Now, as far as CPT is concerned, if we make a disposal of a gift of shares to another family member, then that will be disposed at market value, and therefore there will be a capital gain. 
Now, most people do not want to pay capital gains on gifts, and therefore, providing we have a trading company, that's very important, and remember the definition of trading company for this purpose is the same as it is for ER. So it's your 80-20 test that applies for gift relief. But if you've got a competent gift relief claim, then what happens is you can make a 165 election and hold over the game. I'll go through the mechanics of that in just a few minutes. There is also a concession, SP892, which I will always, um, always uh, recommend that you opt for on the IR295 help sheet. And that means you don't have to spend time doing a market value of the shares for tax purposes. You can elect to dispense, yes, with a market value calculation. And I'll explain why again in a few minutes. As far as IHC is concerned, the transfer of shares clearly is a gift, but to an individual, it will be a pet. Yes, a potentially exempt transfer, and therefore subject to the seven year survivorship rule. But do remember, if the pet fails, all may not be lost, because normally, provided the shares are still held by the recipient, you will get BPR on the failed pet. Yeah? Now, the way in which a holdover relief claim works, the technical mechanics are that you have to make the disposal consideration at market value. So here we have £60,000 uh, market value, knock off our base cost, and therefore that's your capital gain. Now, if no election is made, then that's on which, the amount on which you will pay tax. But if you make a section 165 election, then you will have a holdover here, and you can see what happens to the donee's base cost. For capital gains tax purposes, of course, the market value rule applies. So the donor is deemed to sell at market value, but the donee is deemed to acquire at market value. But if, of course, you make a holdover election, the gain gets deducted against the donee's market value base cost. And anybody, um, your accountants here, you can see some relationship there, can't you, between the donee's base cost after holdover and the donor's base cost. Yes? They're the same, aren't they? They're the same. So why bother to calculate the market value if we do know, unless there are any special features there, that the base cost of the donor will equal the base cost of the donee? And HMRC took them a long time to get hold of that concept, and therefore in, in 1982, they issued a concession to say, don't bother uh, calculating market value, because it's a waste of your time, and it's a waste of our time. Yes? You don't need to do it. Now, um, if you wait until you transfer shares on death, then of course the tax analysis is slightly different. One of the good things about dying, the capital gains tax, is that you get a rebasing of your shares. So if you've got a base cost of 100, and on death your shares are worth 2 million, then the CGT, you have a tax free uplift on death, and the, two million, the shares pass to the legatees, yes, or the beneficiary in your estate, at 2 million. So you've washed away your capital gains tax. Major advantage. As far as the IHT is concerned, provided you've got a qualifying trading company, you have a double advantage, don't you? Because you have a tax free uplift. The CGT and you have an exemption for IHT and that is why IHT share value uh, HMRC shares valuation will not spend too much time thinking about the valuation of your shares because if they're going to be exempt for BPR there's no point in spending time agreeing a value which will be exempt for IHT and therefore you have this valuation issue HMRC will say that yes, you can put in a valuation, um, but it would not be ascertainable. What this means is when the beneficiary comes to sell the shares eventually, they will be relying on this uplifted base cost, which has not actually been agreed by HMRC shares valuation. And therefore, it is very important that in terms of the valuation at the date of death, you keep contemporaneous evidence that supports that valuation, because you will then need to agree that value when it's used on a subsequent CGT calculation of the beneficiary. Yeah, everybody follow me on that. So very important, but you can see just contrasting then, 
if we pass shares down during lifetime, hopefully we'll get hold over and leave so no CGT, but we don't wash out the gain, do we? Because the donee picks up at original base cost. Whereas if we pass shares on death, no capital gain because of tax free uplift, but we get IHT BPR. And therefore, many owner managers, if they just think about that concept, they would prefer to hand over shares on death. But of course, in real life, that's not really that attractive to the next generation because commercial and personal factors will, will drive the fact that we want some shares now. Yeah? We don't want to wait until death till the shares are handed over. So this is where the, the best answer for tax is not the best answer in real life. Yes, because where we want to bring management next generation into the company at a pretty early stage actually so that there is a smooth succession path for the next generation. Now I've just thought while I've got you here, we'll just talk about BPR in a bit more detail. And this is what we call the 5149 rule. Because the way the BPR legislation is phrased is that the first thing is that all companies technically will qualify for BPR, but not if the business is mainly, remember that word mainly, that means more than half, mainly the holding or managing of investments. So as long as you pass that test, i.e. it's not a business which is wholly or mainly the managing of investments, then you will qualify for BPR in the normal course of events, apart from things like property dealing, etc. Now, there have been a number of cases, a load of cases actually, over the last five years, and perhaps the most important one, I think, is the Brander case, um, and that's an aerial view of the Earl of Balfour's estate. And what you can't quite see going on is a mixture of trading and investment activity. So basically on the farm, on the estate, there was farmland, which was actually let, so that's an investment activity. There was farmland that was actually uh, used by the estate itself, so that's owner occupation, therefore a trading activity. There was woodlands management, which probably was trading. There was let cottages, which was investment. And there were sporting rights, which was probably a mixture of trade and investment. So you can see it's a mixed bag of activity and not the principles involved here are quite important when you're trying to determine whether or not you've got a mixed company, yes, a mixed company, whether it's capital gains tax, or BPR, how do you go about ascertaining whether it passes the trading test? And so this was part of the evidence that was used in the case and they looked at a number of factors. So we don't just look at the balance sheet okay the capital employed or the gross assets interestingly in the BPR case here when they looked at the balance sheet analysis between trading and investment assets actually the investments won yes the more value was tied up in the investment activity than the trading activity but because we were dealing with IHT here and BPR the judge said you know what capital employed isn't that a major factor because unless you're going to sell this business Really, it's just another test, yeah, but not very persuasive. What is really important in terms of activity, what is actually going on on a day-to-day -day basis, well, you can see here trading um, in terms of total turnover test, the net profit test, which would also look at expenses of running trading and investment. But what was the crucial point here was what were the employees and the estate workers doing? And therefore, that's why they only took two years, so they had to go back and do a timesheet analysis. You know, what were the employees doing on the estate? Were they doing investment work or were they doing work related to the trading activity? And you can see here, yeah, 70, 80 odd percent of their time was actually spent on trading activity. Revenue actually quite do not like this case because actually went against them. Because what they said, when we looked at all the factors, turnover, expenses, profits, employee time, we conclude that the estate wasn't mainly the carrying on or holding of investment activity. Yeah? And therefore, it did qualify for BPR. And one of the nice points here to think about when we're planning is if you have a company with a little bit of investment in, providing it doesn't go more, you, know, you need to be a fair, a fair sort of cushion there, providing it's not more than half, then the investment activity will qualify for BPR. Yes? because it's an all or nothing relief. On the other hand, if you get this wrong, 
and the investment activity is 51%, then you won't get any BPR on the 49%. And that's why in practice what we do when we have this mixed bag of investment and trading activity, what we sometimes do is partitions or demergers to take the trading bit out one side and the investment business out the other side. At least we've got clean BPR on our trading activity. So that's a very important case. But you'd go through the same principles if you were looking at entrepreneurs relief. All those variables will be taken into account, but remember, the threshold is higher. Yeah, it'd be 80%, not 51%. Okay, I'm not gonna go through that, but that's basically a quick summation of the findings in the Brander case. It's not the man on the Clapham omnibus, it's an intelligent businessman. When he stands back and look at it, is it actually a trading? Does it feel like a trading activity? And it's a question of fact. And you don't just take it in one point in time, you look at a period of time to see really what's going on in this business. Yeah? So very important issues. Now, the reason why I put trust on, I'm not going to talk about trust, but it does come into its own when we look at succession planning. Because I'm sure many of you have got clients, their one big fear is if they give away a large chunk of equity during their lifetime, their biggest fear is it ends up in a divorce settlement somewhere. Yeah, so their children, maybe they get divorced, and of course that will be an asset, yes, of the matrimonial asset, and therefore will be carved up on a 50-50 basis. So when we're talking to clients about succession planning, trust is the thing that probably will actually give them the best protection. So what we may do, rather than giving them shares directly, is we put shares into a trust. And hopefully what I've illustrated on that slide here is that for trading companies, trusts are very benign. Because you can get the assets into the trust without a problem, because you can get holdover relief, and you'll get BPR as well, yeah? Remember, transfers into trust are chargeable transfers, and therefore, yeah, in the normal course of events, you're limited by your nil rate band, aren't you? But if you qualify for BPR on the shares, there's a, no limit at the moment anyway into the value that you can put into discretionary trust. And also you'll see here that the, man, the amounts come out of the trust, again, with capital gains tax protection, holdover, and also BPR, providing this come, the trustees have held the shares for two years. And even if you hold the shares for longer than 10 years, when you come to do your 10-year charge, there's no 10-year charge because BPR applies there. So you can see a very friendly regime for trading, and emphasise this, trading companies. One of the pitfalls though, when I've got the holdover question mark, again, a trap if you're not aware of this, is make sure that your trust is not a set law interested trust. Because if it's a set law interested trust, you will be denied holdover relief. Yeah? And when I mean settler interested trust, I mean settler being a potential beneficiary, spouse, and now importantly since 2016, his minor children. So in the trust deed, you need to make sure that under no circumstances, minor children of the set law can benefit. Otherwise, if HMRC look at the trust deed, they will actually deny your holdover relief. And that's not a nice thing to do, because you'll be paying tax on paper money, yeah? So that's a trap that you need to be aware of. Now we're moving on to purchase of own shares, uh, multiple completion. So, again, I've, I've used Neil Armstrong here. Of course, have we seen First Man? Hands up, we've seen First Man. That's poor, actually. Well done, you've seen it with me, haven't you? Yeah, there we go. It's a very good film about the story of Neil Armstrong, the first man who walked on the moon. Right, anyway, so here we have... Oh, you don't know what Eagle was? No? Yes, it was the lunar module. Actually, I'm glad somebody here is actually got some interest. Right, so, Neil is our ageing shareholder, 75%. He's bought his daughter Karen in some time ago with a holdover election, so she's got 25%. Um, and you can see there along the side where the reserves are. And Neil actually wants to retire from the business, but leave it in the hands of his daughter. So we have a classic purchase own share situation because the company can buy in the shares. Now, a couple of things we need to be aware of here. Can we see that? That's what happens when you do a push on shares. Yeah? 
but of course people think the company suddenly she's got 100% she's doing very well well of course if we get the valuation right for a POS then really she's got 100% but of a much smaller cake yes because when you do a POS assets will leave the company to buy out the shares won't they so if let's say the company was worth 4 billion and we paid out 3 then she will have 100% of a company now worth a million because we've extracted 3 million worth of assets from the company but anyway it's still a good deal if we can get the right tax treatment because remember if we foul up on the tax treatment with the POS it's a distribution for tax and therefore the sale proceeds will tax as though it was a dividend only at 38.1% so um, one of the problems we have though is Neil wants 3 million and under company law he has to be paid on the now yes in other words with a POS unlike other forms of share sale you have to pay the consideration immediately otherwise you will fall foul of the Companies Act and therefore it will be void and that is why multiple completions have come into the ascendancy because it's a way of mimicking but not exactly the same as a deferred consideration transaction because if you look at the cash flow, the most important thing when you do a POS of that magnitude is actually making sure that the buyout proceeds do not knacker the working capital of the company going forward. So the whole thing needs to be planned, a bit like an MBO really, in terms of how can we pay out nil over a reasonable period without prejudicing the company's cash flow. Yeah? Because he does want to go and we do have to pay him three million. And therefore it's a big ask to impose a three million, isn't it, on a trading company in terms of buyout consideration. So we'll come back to that in a minute. The other point, of course, in terms of being companies that compliant is that a buyout of shares or a POS has to be done out of the distributable profits of the company. So you need to make sure before you do one of these, do you have sufficient distributable profits to do it? Now, of course, in our little example here, this was based on a real life example, the reserves are actually in the wrong place, aren't they? Are they? Yes, they are, aren't they? So how do we get the reserves into First Man Limited? Anybody? Excellent, a dividend, yes? We can pay up those reserves as a dividend and because First Man Limited is a company, we have a tax-free dividend in Topco, yep? Yeah? Good. So at least we can sort oh, this is nothing to do with tax. I just thought, I came across this again a year ago and I thought it was so good. I don't actually approve of graffiti, but somebody was actually um, doing quite well there, weren't they? You have to be of a certain age to understand that song. Right, now, uh, where was I? So these are the rules now for doing a capital gains tax structured buyout of shares. First of all, we have to be a trading company. That's a more than 51% test, yeah? Secondly, and this is the most crucial point, you have to do a buyback for the benefit of the trade. And that is why you always have to obtain tax clearance. Because you may think that your buyback is being done for the benefit of the trade, but you need HMRC to agree with you before you do the transaction. Okay? Now we do have some guidance in SP282 about what types of buyback will satisfy the benefit of trade condition. One of course is getting rid of a disgruntled shareholder. But if we're getting rid, as it were, or buying back the shares of an owner manager, HMRC will generally accept that as being for the benefit of the trade if this is part of a clear succession plan in the company, which this is. So we should be okay on that. The other feature that HMRC want to see is the Neil, in this case, he has to resign from being a director. He cannot be a director going forward when we have a buyback if he wants to get his capital gains tax relief. So we need to almost like sever his connection, as it were, with the company. HMRC in practice do not mind um, the outgoing shareholder staying on as an employee or consultant, but that needs to be put down in the clearance and the commercial points made. He's got to be a UK resident, normally not a problem. You've got to have owned the shares for five years. Okay? If you're ever doing a buyback, believe me, that is the first thing you check. I have known accountants spend a lot of time on doing a lot of work on seeing whether they qualify only to find that the shares have not been held for five years 
in which case it's all a waste of time. Yeah? Remember that five year period is reduced to three years if you've acquired the shares on an estate, out of an estate. And of course you can look through husband and wife. So if the husband transfers the shares to a spouse, she can inherit his period of ownership. Remember though, that's not the same for entrepreneurs leave, is it? No, it's not the same for entrepreneurs leave. Because when a husband transfers shares to the wife, that's the start of her entrepreneurs leave period. Yes? So he's now got to own the shares for two years before she qualifies for ER. Yeah? Providing we satisfy all the other tests. Now, um, you have to dispose of all, that's also another point. To qualify under the benefit of trade rule, you have to sell all your shares. Remember, HMRC do allow you to retain a minimum of 5%, or rather a maximum of 5%, for sentimental reasons. So basically what we're saying is if you're going to go, you go. Yeah? You can retain 5%. Not possible to get capital gains tax on selling 40% of your holding. Yeah? HMRC won't wear it. Now, that is also very similar to this test in the um, beige box, because here I'm saying you've got to dispose of all your shares. So why am I saying that? when HMRC in guidance have said you've got to sell all your shares? Well, the reason is that test there includes your associates. This is why a buyback will never work in a husband and wife company. Because you can buy back the husband's shares, but the husband will still be connected with the wife holding shares and therefore will fail that, will fail that test. Luckily though, in the context of POSs, i.e. buyback of shares, your adult children are not your associates. Yeah, so there's a departure from the main rule there. And of course, that, that facilitates succession planning, doesn't it? Because if actually adult children were associates, what we're trying to do here would not work, would it? Yeah? So the daughter here is not connected with him when we're looking at the disposal of all the shares test. And lastly, another connection test you must, be not, you must not be connected with the company immediately after the buyback. That connection test is a 30% test, and that means no more than 30% of the share capital. Normally we won't have a problem with that. No more than 30% of share capital and loan capital. That could be a problem, of course, if you think you're going to self-finance this by doing the buyback and lending the money back to the company, you will be connected under the loan capital test. And lastly, you can't have more than 30% of the voting rights. That could be an issue when we're doing multiple completion. Now, um, how does multiple completion work? Well, in our example here with Neil, he's going to sell, as we said, for three million. But we need to do it in such a way as that we don't nick all our reserves or nick all our cash flow. And so it looks like a deferred consideration deal, but it's not. Okay, it's not. Because, yes, we do have a contract on day one for him to sell all the shares back to the company. Yeah? That's only a contract. We complete it in stages. Okay? So for tax purposes, CGT, remember, if we have an unconditional contract, we get taxed on day one on the full three million. Yes? We lose beneficial ownership of the shares then. And therefore, in the, sell per, in the purchase of own shares agreement, it needs to be said that he can no longer enjoy any dividends on the shares or any capital. All he's got is the right under the contract for future completions of those shares. So HMRC are pretty comfortable with this, it has to be said, although we've had some disagreements with him on various points. But broadly where we've landed is it's not a tax, uh, egregious tax planning scheme. It's all about company law compliance because we need to finance the thing in a way that makes us company law compliant. So on day one, we get the, the major chunk of the consideration of 1.5 million out. And from a legal perspective, do remember that in terms of testing whether or not you've got enough reserves, you only need to test the reserves that you are completing, as it were. So on day one, we only need to have 1.5 in PL to do the buyback, not the full 3 million. So, as you can see here, we've got four completions, and at each of those completion stages, the company will hand over the cash of the, the appropriate amount, and we will, hand, uh, the, we will hand back the relevant number of shares, and we'll tear up the share certificate. Now, you, those of you that read the financial press 
will know that HMRC have been a bit difficult, possibly, about entrepreneurs leaf and buybacks of shares. All I can say is that uh, as a result of discussions we have held with HMRC, they are now on side that the analysis is you do make the full dispose on day one and therefore you'll get your entrepreneurs leaf in this case on the full 3 million and not just on the 1.5, okay? But watch out for that because we have a, a technical release coming through the Institute. Now, so as far as Neil is concerned, that's going to be his capital gains tax. So on day one, 31 January 4 in the end of the tax year 2920, he will have to cough up the £300,000. And the reason why it probably is doable cash flow wise is that it's only a 10% tax charge. Yeah, with entrepreneurs leave. And in fact, by the 31st of January, he may have already had another completion. Yes? So you should have ample cash to pay the tax on the buyback. But a very useful um, technique, this, for getting around effectively um, company law problems with buybacks of shares. So that brings me almost to closing. Um, hopefully in the short time we've had together, uh, you have picked up some good pointers on selling the company and the different types of consideration. Cash, which is taxable now. Defer, well, basically loan notes, remember, to get your entrepreneurs leaf, you need to make an election. And if you're taking shares in the acquirer, normally it will be a share for share exchange with no CGT, but you do need to get clearance. You have to get a share for share transaction. Don't just rely on the fact that it's a share for share and there'll be no tax. It is subject to an anti-avoidance test, and that is why there is a clearance procedure under section 138. And then remember the issue you have with earnouts, and um, that's all about valuing the right to receive the earnout consideration on day one. And if you if you qualify for ER or you're well under the 10 million pound gains limit, you may want to think about um, having a, a more favourable view of the value than not. Because of course, if you increase your earnout valuation, you will increase your entrepreneur's relief on that amount. Remember, you do get leakage though, to the extent that the valuation for your earnout on day one and the actual amount received, that amount there will be 20% when you receive the earnout. Um, some people get worried, what happens if I make a loss? Yes, if I value the earn out at 2 million on day one and we only get 1 million, then of course I have a 1 million loss, don't I, when I come to get rid of my right. Uh, and the way you deal with that loss, of course, is you make an election to carry it back. That's one of the only elections you can do, apart from dying, of course, to carry a capital loss backwards. That, that loss is only available against the share sale gain. And the good thing about the loss carry back means you end up being taxed on the right economic result. We then looked at passing shares down to the next generation. Two routes really, or three really. One is lifetime transfer, which even though is not the best for tax reasons, you will want to um, motivate the next generation. And therefore, you'll be looking at holdover relief to get the capital gains tax uh, deferral, and you'll have the pet treatment for BPR. Waiting till death gives you, waiting till death gives you the benefit of an upgrade in base cost which you might find attractive. In practice, probably a combined approach is possible, i.e. some shares lifetime and maybe leaving the remainder on death. But you do have to have a very clear succession plan and all the um, management school people will tell you that it needs to be communicated to the next generation as early as possible. They need to know where they stand. Now, um, also I mentioned about the use of trust. Um, if a discretion trust, of course, is probably one of the best forms of protection when we're looking at um, divorce situations with our owner managers next generation um, but if you start to use a trust and take income out on a regular basis then a, a divorce court judge will take that into account when he's looking at how to divvy up the matrimonial assets lastly we've looked at purchase phone shares with multi completion and have seen how that can be a very valuable technique to actually take a vast amount of cash out of the company on the retirement of the owner manager at beneficial tax rates. Yeah? So hopefully that's given you all some food for thought. Um, thanks very much for listening. That is the Apollo, the first Earth rise shot taken by Apollo 8. Still one of my favorite pictures. Thank you very much. <laughs>